Welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I'm Joe Johnson, and I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hello, hello. And Andrew, don't drink the Kool-Aid, Walker. Yes, yes. <laughs> and we're joined by a couple of uh, special guests. Some Why don't you newcomers. introduce yourselves, yes. guys? Special guests. I'm Adam Sanborn. I'm special guest Trevor Sexton. <laughs> All right. We're, we're special, special guests. <laughs> and which dating site did you guys meet on? <laughs> Tinder. Tinder. Okay. Great. Tell us how the date went. All right. <laughs> how, um, how do you guys know each other? <laughs> we'll be, <laughs> he was we'll be back in two and two. <laughs> I don't know if uh, you guys get that reference, but. Uh, oh, boy. All right. So today's topic, um, we're going to talk about uh, cults uh, in Hollywood and uh, stories relating to that. Um, probably the most famous cult that most people are aware of is the uh the manson family and uh i remember when uh i went to go see the movie once upon a time in hollywood knowing that it was going to revolve around that period and and uh that atrocity that took place in uh, 1969 i was just really cringing during the entire movie just waiting for them to get to that moment and shockingly Tarantino did his uh, revisionist history uh, where he softened it up a little bit, much to my relief, because uh, I thought I thought I was in for some brutality. Um, but uh, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, Tarantino sort of changed the outcome of that, uh, that film. Uh, the real-life story is much more tragic uh, than what was depicted in the film. Uh, I... Did some uh, research and uh, typed up some notes here, learned a few things along the way. Uh, Charles Manson, born in 1934, he started getting into trouble as early as nine years old when he set his school on fire, which I did not know. Wow. My kids said it, I'm waiting. (laughs) At 14, he robbed a grocery store. Uh, He spent time at Boys Town in Nebraska, which Always reminds me of that line from uh, Caddyshack when uh, Rodney Dangerfield says to the bartender, what time you do back in Boys Town? Yeah. Um, uh, as a youth, he stole a car, committed more robberies, was sent to the Indiana Boys School, a strict uh, reformatory, as they called it. Uh, he was raped and beaten at the school. Uh, and he escaped and attempted to drive to California, committing crimes along the way. Uh, all at the tender young age of 17. Uh, eventually, he was sentenced to three years at Terminal Island in L.A. So, I mean, right out of the gate, uh, this guy uh, experienced all kinds of trauma and, and just got into all kinds of trouble. Yeah, the fuse was kind of lit right there. Yeah, it yeah. Feels like it. Yep. So, um, later, after experimenting with LSD, uh, under the supervision of people who were supposed to be looking out for him, he started preaching his own philosophy with uh, elements based on the Bible, Scientology, Dale Carnegie, and the Beatles, which earned him a following. Uh, and uh, I would imagine, as most cults do, he targeted insecure individuals and social outcasts. Uh, he was a white supremacist, and he believed that uh, an apocalyptic race war was imminent. Uh, he, he coined the, or he didn't coin the phrase. He used the phrase "helter skelter," which was taken from a Beatles song, uh, to describe that race war that he Beautiful was song. predicting. Man. <laughs> uh, later, he spent time with Dennis Wilson of Beach Boys uh, fame, who, uh, shockingly, Dennis Wilson was intrigued by him and enjoyed his company, and introduced him to uh, several acquaintances, including uh, Terry Melcher and Rudy. Alto Belli, who owned a home on Cielo Drive um, that at the time was rented by Terry Melcher and his girlfriend, Candace Bergen. We're going to get back to Cielo Drive in a second. <laughs> um, Terry Melcher, basically, uh, Manson blamed him uh, for not uh, giving him a recording contract and helping uh, nurture his music career. Uh, as some Most people know Manson was an aspiring musician. 
so later, um, the home that he was staying in, uh, the person moved. They all got evicted. Uh, Manson spent a lot of time living in nature and just trying to find a roof over his head. Uh, he had his followers that tagged along. And um, they ended up at the Spahn Ranch in August of 1968. Now, anyone who saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood knows that uh, that was a former movie set, Western set, um, that uh, th there's a guy, um, George Spahn, who lived there, and uh, Manson directed his females to take care of him, so he would allow them to stay on the property. Now, I didn't, I've never visited the actual Spahn Ranch, but uh, earlier this year I visited the location that was used in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It was kind of cool to visit that location, which itself was a former Western set in um, stunt show where people used to go and watch cowboys fall off horses and do all oh, that stuff. Go. Where was that one? So that's in uh, just north of L.A. in California, kind of the uh, Porter Ranch area, just about 45 so minutes hour north of... Uh, location shooting there. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was really cool to see that, the, the location that was uh, in the film. Um, so... They were staying at the Spahn Ranch about a year later on August 8, 1969. Manson directed his followers, Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, and Patricia Krenwinkel, uh, to drive to that home that I mentioned at 150 10050 Cielo Drive in Benedict Canyon, uh, L.A. And Manson had instructed them to go into the house and totally destroy everyone in it uh, as gruesomely as you can. Now, the, the sad part of it, talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, Manson knew that Terry Melcher, who had been responsible for, you know, destroying his music career, had at one time lived at that house. Manson didn't know who lived at it at the time, but he just kind of instructed his followers to go in there. Uh, as bad luck would have it, um, at the time, uh, director Roman Polanski, who had done Rosemary's Baby, he was married to Sharon Tate. Uh, Sharon Tate was at the home. Roman Pal Polanski was overseas. Uh, they had some friends over. Jay Sebring, who was a hairdresser to the stars. Uh, Wojciech Frykowski and girlfriend Abigail Folder, or, uh, Folger, who was uh, heiress to the uh, Folger's coffee fortune. Um, unfortunately, there was a guy who was visiting a caretaker. His name was Stephen Parent. He's the first person that encountered them on the property, and he was killed by uh, Tex outside the home. And then they uh, went into the home and uh, committed their atrocities, which I won't go into. The details are pretty gruesome. Um, Manson was hoping that was going to ignite, be the, the match to the, the powder keg of the race war, and um, didn't get the reaction he was hoping for. So the next night, they went to a home, which some people said was random, but um, Manson and his followers had been to a party uh, next to the home uh, about a year prior, and so for some reason, they, they picked this house that was next to the, the home that they had partied at. Uh, it belonged to supermarket executive uh, Leno LaBianca and his wife Rosemary. And Manson and his followers went in there and, and brutally murdered uh, that couple, which sh those two back-to-back -back, uh, uh, scenes just shocked and sickened the L.A. community. Uh, but again, he didn't get the reaction he was hope, hoping for. He really wanted to start a race riot. And his logic was that he he thought that the black community would win a race war, but they would turn to him to be his uh, their leader. Mm -hmm. He wanted to lead uh, the African-Americans. Yeah. Uh, per perfect logical yeah, sense. very logical. I, yeah. mean, I mean, who can argue that? <laughs> well, he didn't realize at the time that if you want to start a race war, you need a more colorful hat. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, it's um, that someone with that kind of psychopathy can be so charismatic, and and all the people like, well, he's a little odd, but but he's a good friend, he's a great host, and yeah, fun guy. All these different celebrities. He's, that, that he's, he's a good, he's a good musician. Everybody, yeah. like, you've had this sway of the people around him, and that that yeah. says something about how the charisma and the psychopathy kind of go hand in hand here. It's interesting yeah, case. and and that's probably going to be a theme as we go around the table. That you know, these cults prey on the weak-minded and the insecure and um there was something about manson that these people looked up to despite knowing his history and what he was capable of now the the interesting thing about this is that um 
Manson has never been known to actually kill anybody. Apparently, uh, he shot somebody who survived, um, but he never actually killed anybody. But following the trial after these gruesome murders, uh, he was found guilty of first-degree murder. Despite never having actually killed anyone, he just directed his followers to to do that. Um, But he, as we all know, spent the rest of his life in prison uh, where I'm sure he belonged. Needed a better lawyer. (laughs) That's right. Now, um, as I was researching this, I I found a little, a couple of weird little footnotes. Um, One thing I discovered fairly recently is that in the aftermath of this gruesome murder at the Cielo Drive home, uh, Roman Polanski uh, had the task of having to clean the place up. So he did as what uh, what most of us, I think, would do in that situation. He invited a Life magazine photographer to tag along and shoot photos of him cleaning up the mess of his murdered wife. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around that. So um, Yeah, that, that but, class space is weird. He, he was also a pedophile, yes? I mean, he, that was... Yeah, he's, he's, he, so. he can't return to the U.S. <laughs> he so. probably... Uh, yeah, yeah. He's living in France for the rest of his life, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, after the the photos were published in Life magazine, the the guy who owned the house, Rudy Altobelli, uh, he ended up suing Polanski and Life magazine because he felt that the photos hurt the resale of the home. (laughs) Yeah, really the opposite, right? Like, I'm in the famous... Well, he did have trouble selling it. Um, When they sort of laughed it off, he did the unthinkable. He sent a bill to Sharon Tate's parents and then sued her estate for what he was hoping to get, a half million uh, dollars. um, Or or No, not a half million. Yeah, yeah. Was it a half million? And and again, they just sort of laughed it out of court. Uh, So what did he do? He ended up living in the house for the next 20 years because he couldn't sell it to anybody. Wow. Uh, Another interesting footnote is later on in 1992, Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails rented the home, lived in that home, and recorded music in the home, as did, and this is kind of a weird coincidence, um, his guest who also recorded uh, music in the home was none other than Marilyn Manson. Manson. No relation, but (laughs) both of them... uh, told stories of weird occurrences in the house which you might say it was haunted but uh what 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 year was this i'm trying to think what albums would have been uh created yeah 1992 is when trent reznor uh lived in the home uh when he moved out knowing that Mm -hmm. the demolition of the house was inevitable he took the front door uh and he opened up a uh i guess he bought like a funeral home in new orleans and turn that into a recording studio, and that front door of that uh, that studio is the Polanski front door, which is so odd, so strange. Very, but it's a strange eccentric. town and with a lot of coincidences in it. Some, yeah, some people really like the macabre. <laughs> <laughs> so the house was eventually demolished in 1994. A new home was built uh on that location they still had a hard time finding a buyer they kept lowering the price over and over and over again until someone bought it and the new owners uh, i don't recall who they are but uh, they claimed of hauntings and weird things going on uh, at the new property the new home that was built on the location um i did visit uh, cielo drive and got as close as the gate would allow me to get we really couldn't see the house from where we were standing but um, we did take pictures of uh, Cielo Drive when I was there um, a couple of years ago. I think it was 2019 uh, we were there. We were trying to visit all the locations of uh, of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Right. And they did actually film when, when, um, when uh, Cliff is driving his little blue convertible. They actually shot some of those scenes on Cielo Drive. Nice. Uh, so we visit, visited that as the filming location. But, yeah, you can't get access to the, the property where the, the gruesome uh, murders took place. Joe, I bet if you were a social media influencer, they would let you in there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, like, you this is like a Manson family style, too. So, <laughs> so a- Adam and I just looked up uh, what uh, Nine Inch Nails album what, that would have been, been created. <laughs> yeah. that came out in 94. 
And Adam, what do we have? Uh, the downward spiral, uh, with the, known with for its nihilism and defined by a prominent theme of self abuse and self control. So he really got into that headspace of the negativity of murders happening. And, and, wow. and you know that song. Everyone knows the song "Closer," right? Yeah. I'm not familiar with their music, so we probably shouldn't play it on. I <laughs> but anyway, because <laughs> Johnny Cash covered it. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, wow, interesting. That, that, that's on the album. Uh, not on this one, but that's, oh, okay. that's the extensive yeah. anyway. snails knowledge. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> So one final footnote, uh, a member of uh, the Manson family who was not involved in those murders, uh, she went by the nickname Squeaky? Squeaky Frome. Squeaky Frome. Uh, she was a member of the Manson family, and uh, even though she didn't take part in the murder, she was part, she like uh, protested outside during the trial saying uh, uh, Manson had nothing to do with it. Um, but in 1975, about a decade or so later, uh, she she did try to assassinate Gerald Ford, but she I mean, it was sort of a, done it for her. Uh, what's that? The flight, the flight of stairs. He was eventually. <laughs> <laughs> now, even though she was uh, convicted of uh, uh, attempting to assassinate Ford, she she claims, and there's evidence to support this, but that she did not have the chamber loaded with a round, even though there were rounds in the gun. But she deliberately left the chamber empty and they found a, a spent uh, a bullet in her home. Uh, so she, her defense was, well, I wasn't really going to shoot him, but <laughs> she, she leveled a gun at Gerald Ford, but just didn't pull the trigger. So how, how good was her lawyer? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And so, so she did end up going to prison and she ah. was uh, paroled in 2009 and is currently living in New York. Um, Manson, as we story. all know, Manson died in prison but one thing that blows my mind is Tex, uh, the guy who they uh, depicted heavily in, in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is still living uh, in prison, s still alive. And, and this is, I don't know why this irks me so much, he has fathered several children from prison, <laughs> has married. <laughs> um, visits are real. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I can't get a date, but Tex <laughs> is fathering children from prison. And he so. got... Elvis to play him uh, in a movie. There you go. <laughs> right? Don't take the wrong <laughs> lessons. <from> yeah, <laughs> Joe. I mean, it's not like look, Joe. Some people are just drawn to serial killers, and you don't have to be. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's probably uh, one of the most uh, famous cults, um, at least connected to Hollywood. Um, there are some other things we're going to go around the table and talk about. Um, but again, you know this. What was it about him that, that drew this loyal following that even though they knew what they were doing was wrong, they said, well, if, if Charlie says so, we're, we're going to do it. I, I just don't understand that mentality. And, and we have a tendency on this podcast to get a little political sometimes. And I think we're, I'm seeing the same things happening in today's world, that there is a guy who has what I would describe as a cult following in this country – um, who's not a good person. He's, uh, he's racist, he's uh, homophobic, he's uh, misogynist, but people adore him and follow him. Talk about Tom Hanks that way, please. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm in the cult of Tom Hanks. I have been a follower of Tom Hanks since Bosom Buddies. Um, but He's only a little anti-Semitic. <laughs> But yeah, so you, you see this the same recurring theme that um, bad people somehow get loyal followers and people who swear that they do no wrong. And it's just a mentality I will never understand. Is it a, a mental illness? I don't know. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Why I, do people follow people like Char Charlie Manson? You know, it's interesting, Joe, you said that this started was around 1968. So that was, you know, the... The year of revolution. It was like the year of you know summer love. You talk you talk about the counterculture and everything that was going on in there, and where the nation was at that time, and you could see reflections right now. I mean, when the person that we're talking about, the orange menace, as I like to call, sometimes <laughs> refer to it, since I don't use names anymore at this point. Carrot top. There you go. <laughs> you know, tiny hands. <laughs> you know, the thing is, uh, if you look at the, what. For me, it's about just if there's underlying anger, and people who don't feel that they're being heard, they'll they'll some there's a vacuum and people will fill it with anything that they can. They just look for a source of the anger, and someone has to come along and just say the right terms. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, 
uh, we can use the historical figure. He's, I don't know how he's charismatic, but apparently everyone that who's when you watch documentaries, they talk about Hitler like this. Oh, the, exactly. The dude doesn't have any room presence. You see, you see his speeches. The guy's yelling into the mic the whole time, <laughs> and you're like, dude, you need to take a chill pill, man. You're gonna have an aneurysm, which wouldn't have been a bad thing. But yeah. you know, but people are just like, yeah, he just he's speaking to us. He, you know, he he yeah. filled a void in us. You know, it's it's like you said, it's people who are lost. You know, in um, in the in the cult that I I uh. uh research it was children of children of god and for them uh, uh, a um, former uh, uh evangel evangelist uh david berg started it and he was a failed evangelist he came from a very strict background i think he got caught masturbating once and his mom caught him and made him masturbate in front of everybody <laughs> oh geez <laughs> to show that and you know so just, then just like what happened to louis ck right I mean, just, <laughs> yeah. just, but that that dude just never learned. No, and and, and you kind of see like how, you know, and it's like so for him we were talking about a fuse being lit. You talk about Charles Manson was raped. Yeah, and so so you always see like some kind of trigger that sets these guys off, and then it starts building. And he had a bunch of failed churches. He moved out to California with his wife and his kids. They couldn't figure out what he was doing, and then all of a sudden he saw, 1968. He saw the counterculture. He saw what you know. Everyone was like, you know what. Uh, where the nation was, how many dis disaffected people were there, and he said, "Okay, I'm going to adjust my message, unlike other churches. I'm going to lean into, turn to the tide of, you know, free love, and you don't need drugs, you don't need, uh, you know, all sorts of things, and you can just have, you know, turn turn to God. And I'm the voice of God, and these the all of them always say something. You know, he was preaching apocalyptic end times. The apocalypse is coming. He would cherry pick pieces of the Bible hmm. and come out there." And you know, people gravitate to it. A lot of broken people at the time, and yeah. they and they would go. And children of God, they started using uh, uh, sex as ways to recruit people. I'm like, well, that's the easiest thing to recruit people in. If you're, <laughs> like you're it's gonna like have sex sugar with... cubes for a yeah. horse. Yeah, it's like you, know, you talk to a bunch of guys like, hey man, all these young women are gonna have sex with you if you just listen to what they have to say. I'm like, yeah, I'll listen to anything you have to say. If you yeah, have sex with me. So, you know, they they call them. Um, uh, uh, FFs. It was like uh, uh, um, uh, flirting fishies is is the thing that that, that happened mm -hmm. later. But I mean, they ended up uh, after leaving uh, the children of God left California in '68 and ended up going to Texas and they got a ranch there, 425 acres given to him because David Berg had a friend named Fred Jordan who was an evangelist, and he said, "Hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to start this thing. It's not a cult, but I'm preaching the words of Jesus. No, I'm really not." And then all of a sudden, people come there. They start calling him Moses. Even now, when you watch documentaries, people call him father. They still refer to him as father. I'm like, that is some hardcore stuff. It just mm -hmm. gets wired into the brain that he, I'm the only one there. All these teenagers, all these young people's families, they they formed a um, anti-cult movement called Free Cog. So it's COG, Children of God, so Free Cog in 1971, trying to get their kids out of there. And they couldn't do it. They finally started to get reports of, you know, hey, you know, I think he's doing polygamy. I think he's doing sexual abuse. Some people like, I don't know if this is for me. They would leave and then they would say, this is what we experienced. There was child abuse. And the guy had to flee the country. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how Manson was, you know, yeah. I guess going to try and flee the country. But, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, and you, you talk about when we're talking about uh, the Orange Menace. After what happened, I think, the financial crisis in 2008, I don't think people recovered. Because you have to think about it. If if racism is not going anywhere, right? But you know how badly you have to screw up, where even people who vote conservative are like, "I'm going to give the black guy a chance." Yeah, I mean, yeah, twice. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then some of those same people then said, "Nope, I'm going back to the orange menace." Yeah, and I think what happened when when Obama got elected president, I saw something that was uncovered that I'd never seen before, like family members and stuff when we'd get together for family gatherings. They spewed vile hatred for Obama that shocked me. And I think what unifies that group, which I'll refer to as MAGA, I think what brings them together is hate. hate you hate the same person I hate. I remember driving past the uh, Lake Orion post office and seeing people outside the post office with large banners of Obama with a Hitler mustache. And I'm like, what? And, uh, and so I think hate unifies these cults, Anger, they, yep. they they're oppressed yep. and uh, rebel against authority. Oh, you, know, you do so do I, and and somehow they, they it speaks to each other. And and the, they, the need, something to, they also, need something to blame. They need something to blame. It seems yeah. like a, a 
a key uh, common denominator is whatever that their club is, like whatever the medium of their club is, they're factually uh, inept about what they're supposed to be hating, like COVID deniers or election deniers or it's just they just don't know basically how – it works or yeah. they're, they're willfully never let a fact get ignorant. in the way of a good feeling <laughs> yes yes exactly yep yeah and that's the thing these people uh want their opinions validated they yes. don't yes. want they don't want me to come along and contradict them you think they're going to follow me if i go nah, you're, you're, no you're wrong on that they yeah. get angry when you contradict them so they're looking for someone to validate these feelings that they have and these opinions that they have. And when they're around like-minded people, they tend to Because they feel like congregate. they're not being heard. I think yep. that's another thing. They say, like, no one's saying what we think. Everyone's also saying we shouldn't be saying these things we think. They're trying to cancel us. They're trying to censor us. You know, you know what, what happened to free speech? I'm like, well, there's free speech, but there's consequences for free speech. Say what you want, but then don't be surprised when people say, well, can't work with you. Right. Or yeah. I can't include you in certain things, or we're not going to do that. You know, it's just, you know, say what you want, but. Yeah, and the thing I don't understand is when it, a couple of these cults, the end result is that they commit mass suicide together. You look at Jim Jones. Oh, yeah. You look at the, the cult where the spaceship was supposed to come get him. I forget what that one was called. Yeah. So how how does that leader convince them to take that way out? Heaven's Gate, wasn't it? Uh, Heaven's Gate, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Jim Jones thing, not a lot of people willingly drank the Kool-Aid. Some of them were forced to drink the Kool-Aid. Um, but a lot of them did. There's online an audio recording of those final minutes of Jones. Oh. I have listened oh, to wow. it. It is disturbing. I've never heard that. It is a lot that. of people calming other people down, like giving Kool-Aid to the kids and yeah, stuff. Yeah. It's, it was a tough listen, but it was, yeah. it was really interesting. Like yeah. and and of course you know Jones is not the first one to drink the Kool Aid. He's right. he's uh you know directing everybody. It's like now calm them down. Nope, you can't Did, leave. No, just just take yeah. that. And Didn't it's, a, it's time. a congressman get killed down there? Yeah, he got shot or something. Like they were trying to board a plane or whatever and, and got shot on the tarmac. Wasn't he trying to like kind of calm the situation down? And you're like, I can, think so. Convince, I think he was trying to convince intervene. Convince him. Yeah. That, yeah. See, that's a, that's a story I don't know much about, and I need to. I'm sure there's a good documentary about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, I saw something. This I'm surprised this even aired. Do you guys remember there was a TV show hosted by Tracy Morgan where they tried to scare people? Yes. Uh, do you remember that? It was like yes. a reality show. Yeah, and, it was actually really weird yeah. and disturbing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and there was one in particular. Like I said, I'm surprised it aired. I think aired, it's on Netflix now. Where a guy took a friend to meet th- these people, which you know they didn't come out and say was a cult, but it was all actors, you know. So he brings his buddy to this gathering, and they all start drinking from this punch bowl. So the friend who was being pranked sees everybody drinking from the punch bowl and pretending to drop over dead. So what does this guy do? He drank from the punch bowl. Oh. And uh, afterward, they're like, feel included. Yeah. They were like, why? Why would you drink? And he goes, Well, everybody else was. And I'm like, oh, my God, is that the mentality everyone else was? I didn't want to cause trouble. So and also that's shocking and to also, me. Also, uh, the, the, in the 1950s, the Milgram experiment. Yeah. Right? Do you remember? Uh, it was that the one where there's someone who would just stand outside a door and then people would just line up and see what they're doing? Oh, right. Uh, no, no, that's si- something similar. different. This is where uh, the person who was in control, like, would shock. The electric shock. Yeah, yeah, the electric shock. Yeah. yeah. They um, have an, act, it, uh, an actor who was portraying right, Peter and then because the yeah. they tried to r- realize how uh, the w- the Germans did in the Holocaust, like how you know otherwise ordinary people yes. can be compelled through social pressure to yeah. do yes. horrific things, yeah, right. So that's the other angle of it to get to get your cult followers to to uh, a call to action. Mm-hmm. So, so one thing that's that's kind of come to my mind in some of some of the things I've heard here is the way that people think. Uh, the best thing I think I ever read was from a site called Wait But Why by a guy called Tim Urban. He wrote a, a piece called The Story of Us. This and and um, I think it was chapter seven of this thing. He talked about the the levels of thinking, sort of the hierarchy of the ways people think. And the point he was making, um, in short, was that what's important is not what you think; it's how you think. Mm-hmm. And on the two ends right. of the spectrum, he had the different levels to it. But the two ends of the spectrum were thinking like a scientist, which is is you see the facts and then you base your hypothesis on the facts and your hypothesis and, and your, your conclusion can be changed. 
Um, and then the other end of the spectrum was thinking like a zealot, which is this is the truth, and any facts that don't support these the truth this truth lie. that is, is false that is a yeah. lie. Mm-hmm. And then there were different levels in between for high yes. level or low level thinking. It was a really interesting mm-hmm. description, so I encourage everybody to check can, that out. Can you, wait, but why is the name of the site? And it was the story of us. I think chapter seven. Wait, um, best wait, thing I ever read. But, like that is that is my Bible now. But wait, every, but why dot com? Uh, I believe so. Um, every one of these stories has a lot of zealotry in it. Mm-hmm. You get a few people who will think like a zealot for you, that you are essentially infallible as the leader here. And the irony of that is every single one of these leaders had huge mistakes and setbacks in their past, including up to and including the Orange Menace. Right. Um, but but they minimize that. And the thing they all seem to have in common is this, this grandstanding ability to make you believe that they're perfect regardless of what the facts say. Right. Um, the yes. uh, the additional cult that I was looking at a little bit here, the most recent one I think that came was Nexium. Yes. Um, the, the sort of sex cult that really intrigued the public um, with uh, Smallville actresses involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, particular. yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, she, re- she recruited, right? This, yep. Yeah. Um, this guy, Keith... Uh, Keith Rainier was the was the head of this thing, and he was an imprisoned racketeer and sex offender already before this ever happened. Uh, um, and hmm. so he starts this supposed business with seminars about human potential development, and and then starts like having sex with his inner members. He recruits these attractive yeah. girls and uses them as sort of a honeypot situation to get yeah. more people. Starts blackmailing people, and it becomes a whole thing. And, and suddenly, <laughs> and you've got famous people involved. And this is like. You know, Scientology Epstein, Junior, a Epstein, little bit more hedonistic, yeah. right? Yeah, Epstein level. Now, since you brought up Scientology, let's let's talk about that a little bit. I, and I'm hoping uh, I don't put myself in any sort of legal jeopardy by comparing Scientology to a cult. You are already um, sued. Yeah, we're all, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I saw the Leah Remini uh, documentary, so she, she's said everything that uh, you know needs to be said, and if right. she hasn't been sued, but uh, she was in, she got out, she kind of exposed it. Uh, you've heard rumors. You've heard stories. Um, they they slowly reveal. Well, first, when when you join Scientology, you have to give up all your worldly possessions, and then uh, they reveal each level as you accomplish one level and move on to the next one. They reveal what it is, and then all of a sudden, when you get pretty high up in the ranks there, they start talking about the aliens and the spaceships and all that stuff. And they're like, and you have to pay what? a quarter million dollars to get to the next level. Or, yeah. And yeah. critically trying to get out is an absolute yeah. nightmare because they make you record your secrets and use them to keep you in. Yeah. As well as they can. Yep. So, uh, Andrew, did you do some research on Scientology here? Yeah. Like, well, what, what do you have to share about Scientology? All right. Um, well, Last weekend when I was in downtown Detroit for Yumacon with a, a friend of mine in this room, we walked yeah. uh, back and forth between uh, Kobo's Huntington Place and uh, the Renaissance Center. And right on Washington, or n- not Washington, uh, Jefferson, there is a beautiful Scientology building. I had no idea. So yeah. I snapped a, a nice picture wow. of it. Um, and I'm sure you guys have all have heard of uh, Danny Masterson from uh, – that 70s show, yep. Scientologist, accused of, credibly accused of, uh, I, I believe four, maybe five now. Uh, uh, wasn't Laura Pepper, li- or his co-star also in that? Laura Pepper? The, She's a Scientologist, she, but yeah. I don't know. His brother was one, too, uh, from Malcolm in the Middle. Yes, yeah. and, the, and, the, and the sister from Walking Dead. They're all in on it. Yeah, quite a few actors that so, otherwise seem normal. Yeah. Jason hmm. Lee was one. Kirstie Alley. Anyway, yeah. that, <laughs> yeah. but anyway, but... Um, so like my per- my closest personal Scientology connection is through Masterson, one of the women that we, uh, he was dating at the time uh, is now married to my favorite singer, uh, and he's got two bands. So the last two albums that he did, one with one band, one with a different band, it was him dealing with that in a semi-public way. The songs are about being surveilled, uh, being uh, having uh, their phones tapped. Mm. Um, a- apparently, uh, someone fed their their dog uh, poison and killed it. Mm. And Jeez. so, and so that's still going on though. He's out. Last I saw, he's out on three million dollars bail. Um, so mm. they're just st- still mm. trying to trying to get him. They they'll eventually get him on something. But uh, the the links that I've read about. Because the 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 singer Cedric Bixler Zavala, he's pretty open about it on social media, and right. he said, you know, this is these are the facts. This is what I can legally talk about. And um, 
so I, on Instagram, he always just like tells it like it is. And he's like, mm. I got involved in this at, at a really low point in my life in 2008 or 2009. And that's where you met his wife mm. and they got into it wow. and then they got out around, I think 2014. So they were in for a couple of years. And so that's, that that's been my view on it and how he talks about how they, they are so manipulative, manipulative, they know every single thing about you because yeah. when you first walk in the confessional, as he calls it, you have to tell everything, yeah. every well, every I mean, person you, against you, every person right. you've slept with, every, everything, and then from there on out they own you, and trying to get out. Well, you see with Leah Remini and be ashamed if some of these facts were to become public. Yeah, yes. it, it wouldn't it wouldn't have shocked me if they consulted the CIA handbook. You know, like the Dulles oh, yeah. brothers. I mean, like, oh, yeah. or the mafia tactics, basically. Like, these are all the classic extortion. Yeah, yeah. They, they didn't reinvent the wheel, but they just used it really well, and they used it in the right city. Yeah. yeah. Now, one thing, I, w there's a couple of names we haven't mentioned. Some of the biggest names associated with Scientology, of course, Tom Cruise, John Travolta. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when, at what point in their careers did they get involved with Scientology. Sometimes I wonder what role Scientology played in either it you know, advancing their careers? Like, is, is Scientology so prevalent in Hollywood that if you're a Scientologist, it will open doors for you and ensure those, you know, big budget productions? I don't know, but, yes. you know, Travolta and Cruz have enjoyed tremendous fame, and I don't know if Scientology played a role in that or not, um, but uh, they are the face of Scientology. I mean, well, Scientology you, almost killed John Travolta's career with Battlefield Earth. I mean, he, he put oh, a lot yeah. of credibility into that movie came out in 2000, and it was a flop. I've yeah. got the answer to your question here. Uh, it looks like Cruz converted in 1986, uh, and okay. his first wife, Mimi Rogers, converted him. So he uh, had you know, uh, Top Gun. He was filming right at that time and right around then, um, but he had already done Risky Business. So he was, was coming into his own, but certainly the connections made there didn't hurt. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. Now, uh, I met Travolta in 2000, and you brought up uh, uh, Battlefield Earth. He was promoting the movie when I met him. And he had uh, paperback uh, uh, novelizations of the film. And so after our, our team uh, interviewed him, he willingly signed him and, and yes. handed him out. So I have a signed yes. copy of nice. Battlefield Earth, the novelization, in my home. The yes. only the only downside is he he signed the black cover with a black sharpie, so <laughs> you got to angle it just right it's to see it. That's that's, <laughs> that's spot on, Travolta. And uh, so <laughs> then a, a few years later, or not even a few years later, later that year, uh, I was an extra at a movie at Tiger Stadium called Sixty One, and uh, yeah. the I'm, I'm drawing a blank. The actor that was in there that played uh, Roger Maris. Oh, I know he was in Searing Pride Ryan. He was the sniper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Ed, Ed Burns. No, 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 not Ed Burns. Oh, uh, you guys, he? No. Giovanni One of you guys with your phone in your hand, you're going to have to help me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, Southern accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's, he's a, he was in Green Mile. He, he, played, he played Roger Maris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Barry Pepper. Yeah, Pepper, Pepper, yeah, yeah. There it is. So I worked for two weeks on this film. Barry Pepper played Roger Maris in this film. Imagine his reaction when I walked up to him one day, because we were all starting to get pretty close on set. <laughs> And I handed him the Battlefield Earth book because he was in Battlefield yeah. Earth with Travolta. Uh, he's the protagonist. And so I've I, never seen it. I said, uh, it is hey. very uh, entertaining. Yeah. I, I said, hey, uh, this uh, uh, Travolta signed this. Can you sign it too? And you could almost audibly hear his eye roll. Like his, his eyes almost popped out of his head when he saw it. And I, and I, I tried to soften the blow and I said it wasn't that bad and he's like you're the only one that seems to think so a gig's a gig he took the book he signed the cover this time in a gold sharpie and oh, handed nice. it back to me so oh, I got Travolta nice. and Pepper on the cover of the book but Very cool. um but yeah Travolta was uh he he went all in on that movie which was a sci-fi interpretation of the tenets I guess of Scientology that is widely known to be one of the biggest box office bombs in movie history uh, and I haven't seen it since uh, I did see it in the theater, believe it or not. But I haven't seen it since. I'm, I may have to revisit it one of it's, these days. It's worth it. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. It's, if you yeah, like yeah, bad I, movies, I, it, I, I mean, you watch it. I mean, you have Forrest Whitaker Forrest in there, and you Forrest Whitaker, oh, like nice. John Travolta just chewing the scenery over the top. Every delivery is bad. It's, it's a delight. Yeah, yeah. But so, his, but his career recovered after yeah. that because that was you figured that would have been you know. Pulp Fiction. You burned all the Pulp Fiction credibility in 1994. You yeah. did this in 2000. Mm -hmm. yep. So. Yeah, I, I, I did a uh, 
Pristine Peninsula episode where I was a guest and someone else was the host. And my, <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys are on this, but I, I remember. <laughs> I, what would you remember my yeah, character? Did the, I, I did a Tom Cruise impression in that episode. It was not good. Okay. <laughs> my character was Tom Travolta Masterson mixing all three of those guys together. Wow. And I was just, the, it was just sick. Anyway, oh I had to throw yeah. that in there, a little sh- shameless self-promotion. <laughs> Just now, that. I had no idea that uh, Scientology had a recruiting office in Detroit. Probably yeah. their most famous location is on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, Franklin. Oh, yeah. Right. And I, yeah. I usually take a wide uh, arc. Ar- I, I freak out because there's people standing in front of the building yeah. hanging out pamphlets and stuff as you walk past. Do they, is that what they're doing uh, in Detroit? Not they- yet, but oh, okay. that's the second time I've been down there. And I, the first time uh, I when, – when I was down there um, – and I took pictures of the theater where Houdini oh, died. Oh, Houdini, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just zipping around on, on one of those electric scooters, and I was right in front of the Scientology building looking inside. There was wow. a security guard there, but um, it, was, like, it wasn't open. Uh, they keep like regular hours, I guess. I would love to go undercover with a, with a wire could and, you imagine and a see how far I could get. You might never come out, though. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've actually taken a Scientology personality. Really? Test. Wow. It turns out I have depression, major depressive <laughs> disorder. <laughs> now, that sounds dangerously close to psychology, my friend. I'm just, they told me that if they could solve it, but I, I respectfully declined. Wow. Missed opportunity, bud. I suppose so. So what do you think the, the general consensus is? Is is Scientology a religion, a cult, a scam? I mean, they they all, all of the above. They bought the the, the organization uh, has bought up property all over the world and is worth billions of dollars. I and s- but because it's a religion, it's not taxed. I I did the only other Scientology place I've seen was the one in Clearwater in this big old beautiful, I uh, Art Deco maybe style uh, hotel. Beautiful building. I forgot what they call that home base or whatever. Mm. But, uh, yeah, beautiful building hmm. in Clearwater. I yeah. think Scientology is different things to different people. For for a certain group of true believers, yeah, it's definitely a religion. You know, they genuinely believe L. Ron Hubbard, the science fiction writer, coincidentally created a religion that is a little bit science fiction-y yeah. um, <laughs> because they're dumb. But uh, for a lot of people, I think it's just a networking thing. You know, it's just such a powerful force in Hollywood. I mean, ultimately – knowing the right people is everything in Hollywood. And if you're a Scientologist, suddenly you know the right people. Is that worth Mm. a certain percentage of your paycheck? Maybe it is. So, Mm. I mean, from a purely business perspective, I'm sure there are agents who probably tell you, go join Scientology. It'll work out better for your career. I I once heard a defender of Scientology take a very close turn to, like, anti-Semitism. And I was like, this is not going to end well for you. He's like, you know, there's not that many Jewish people on the planet. And, you know, everyone says that Jewish people control Hollywood. So. And it's about networking. You have to know who you know. And so why not Scientology? And sort of the third part of that, the cult business of it, and the thing that I think makes it a cult is the way that it treats its former members and the way that it treats the outside society. Anybody who tries to investigate, anybody who speaks out against it, you're going to have an army of lawyers against you. You're a suppressive person. A toxic personality, right? And that's kind of the origin of using toxic to describe somebody, I think, comes from Scientology. Including their own family members. Widely used language now. Yeah, they they will use whatever they can against you they will try to mm. psychologically destroy you if that wasn't happening then then it, you could just describe it as a religion or a networking tool right. and say you can believe whatever weird thing you want as long as you're not harming anybody but because of what they do to people who investigate and people who try to escape that life that's what pushes it into cult territory to me yeah i, I wonder if this in- incoming congress can uh, start some some public proceedings about what they no- have on on the church, because I mean, I'm sure they got evidence that they could <laughs> Here's start pu- pulling the plug on. I'm that. sure that, but this is Congress. If, they, if you talk about the Scientologists knowing every little piece of dirt on you, yeah, right. right. You know, that's but not it, end it, it just it's going to take for the right person to right. fall higher up. But that's going to bust the whole thing open because it's obviously a criminal enterprise. You know, right? oddly enough, uh, of all the things, I it would be the orange menace that would probably do it. He's the one person I, who... I hope so. Who has, like... Who has <laughs> you just like, have to convince know. him that he's Scientology like, has insulted him somehow. Yeah, you like, just, yes. Nobody can take me down. That's, <laughs> he's so deluded. He's the only person I think would be like, you know what? Yo, CIA, you, are you listening? Yeah, he's like... Yeah, this is the guy that says, you know what? I'm going to go after the three-letter organizations. I'm like, you are dangerously suicidal. The only reason I don't see Trump pursuing that is I think he admires people like that. Oh, he admires yeah. dictators and... He wants to learn from them, and I think he probably think he's probably fascinated by Scientology. Like, how did they pull yeah, this off? Interesting yeah. ideas. Yeah, exactly, exactly. After this, I'm going to have to search 
you know, hit Trump's no, view but, on something. No, but I, but I think Adam was on to something. If they happen to insult him, I think it's it's so fickle. Oh, you're right. If as soon just, as you he, slight him, he, yeah. He comes like, I, I'd like to learn from you. <laughs> well, you know, Donald, you're pretty incompetent in what you do. Is that, what did you just say? <laughs> they're both so careful of their image that once you start that ball rolling, it'll yeah. go out of control. That's yeah. the beauty of it. I think they may have a, a path forward. Here, yes. Honestly. Oh, I think they would love to recruit him. I think they'd love I would, to I would have just him kinda, I would just kind of aim both of weapons at each other. And like, <laughs> All right, everybody just stand back now. Everybody yeah. just stand back. Watch the fireworks. Yeah. yeah. But like I said, you know, a lot of those themes we talked about we're still seeing today. As a matter of fact, today's Trumpism, if, if, if you question Trump to a MAGA person, they react with anger. If you say, I support women's rights, they're like, you're a baby killer. It's like, what? <laughs> Where, if, the if, jumps. If uh, you support yeah. someone's right to kneel during the anthem, you hate this country. You hate the military. It's like, don't. That's that slippery slope yeah. thing. Like, don't go there. Yeah. And that's that attack, that that vile uh, response but, that they come back with. But there's something happening across the planet, Joe. I mean, you think about in Italy. They just elected fascists yeah you're right they came back into power and you're like wait what did we just come full circle on this what, what is happening look here? what happened in the uk yeah and, yeah, and then yeah. you see what's happening in in, in belarus and then you see in poland and hungary and then it's 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 this creep that's happening it's anywhere there's kind of instability suffering people not feeling they're being heard it's the same old ingredients there's nothing new to this it happens yeah. every every time some leaders come in and say hey guys we should probably do something really fast and, and, and you know address some of these needs you probably you know, like calm things down, like turn yeah. the water temperature down instead of boiling. It's just that simmering heat. I think what we're seeing here in the United States is the white man is uh, a decade or two away from becoming a minority. I have no and I, country and I think they're they're threatened by that, and they're res- they're responding with outrage, and um, they are uh, their opinions, their ideals are a minority opinion, and I think this most recent election kind of proved that. That yes. I think sanity won this most recent election, and it reassured me that that hatred that uh, is is a minority opinion. I hope. I I, I, I think what what happened was specifically with Obama. So I, I think we've drilled down to the fundamental nature of the cult mindset. It's it's otherness. It's tribalism. It's you are the in group. You are part of my special group. They are the others. They are bad. Yes. Whether that, whether it's a political movement, whether it's a cult, it's all fundamentally the human nature to be a part of a tribe and exclude others from that tribe. Yes. And I don't think you can fix that part of human nature. You just have to recognize that your impulse to be part of an in group to to alienate others is not a, a way to build society. It's not a way to effectively work within society we have to get past that but it's very hard because it's so fundamentally built into our very primal nature mm-hmm. that's great yes man yeah. that's awesome yes yes uh, I, I was just going to say about uh oh in 2008 what happened with obama is being the first black president and i'm sure you could hear the same thing uh the first black anybody or for whatever reason jackie robinson yeah whatever um some white people subconsciously saw that as, oh, well, he got elected to the the very highest position in our country. And here I am, you know, I dropped out of high school and black people, black people, they're, they're not supposed to be present because, you know, they haven't ever been one. And so a, a lot of white, maybe uneducated white people thought subconsciously, oh, there's something wrong about this. Mm-hmm. He he jumped the line. Now, yeah, I, yeah. He, he doesn't know his to place. I've seen it, but I assume nothing like ha- that happened to Jackie Robinson. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I think I think the thing to remember here, though, because it's it's very easy to point at you know the the older generation or the the MAGA people and that and say, well, look at that. They've succumbed to this cult and to get real, you know, cocky and high horse. But I think I think the important thing to remember is that. It is fundamental to our nature. And I see people on the far left do exactly the same thing. Maybe a little less destructively in current because because when you have, you know, certain values, it's it's uh, probably inherently less destructive. But it is that tribal thinking of, well, these people are less than human. Um, when, in fact, if you sit down and talk with somebody like that, I think you're actually going to find more common ground than you expect. Yes, yes. Right. Yep. Right. And I think... The majority of the people that I know that I have friends and family members who skew right, I skew left, 
but we're all very close to center. And sometimes having a conversation, I'm like, oh, you make a good point. Or they might concede my point. And I think that's the majority of Americans. I think we can get along. I think we can agree. It's the extremists that get the headlines, that make the most noise. And uh, I, I really pray that they're in the minority, that that's not the prevalent uh, thought in this country. And the really sad part of that is you get into the cultish thinking when you're isolated from those normal people mm-hmm. who are not that way. Yeah. And and what we have going on in, in the targeting of the media and in the political ads is pushing everybody to those extremes one way or another, yeah. which is which is increasing the prevalence of the, this sort of cultish thinking, whether it's an actual cult or not. And then you talk about people when the pandemic happened, you talk about bad timing, everyone got to go into their own little echo chambers. Yes. Yeah. And then there's no, oh. there's no counterpoint. You're, you're at home. And everything that you want is in that online. Yeah. Everything one hears is reinforced. And here's a link that says you're right. Here's a link that says I'm right. You know, that's a great point because, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people discuss this. Like when we went into lockdown uh, in 2020, I envisioned us coming out of that like stronger and united, kind of like after 9 11, you know, patriotic and bonded. And the exact opposite happened where I'm like, everyone's lost their goddamn mind. Well, you're a good person, John. You're a better man than I am. I have no <laughs> such faith in you, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was shocked. And, and you make a great point that in that isolation, you, you gravitate to people who. Um, validate you and, and you find these sources you know you, you've all seen those charts with the right media and left media and, and all that stuff and people went and found these sources that validated their opinions and then they come out of that with this bold, emboldened uh, personality that you know, I, I just mentioned this recently online there's no consequences for your actions or normally I mean something might come back and bite in the butt later. But when you're online and you go to someone's YouTube video and you call them a name, there's no immediate consequence for that. Where in public, you're going to get popped in the mouth if, if you <laughs> say to someone to their face what, what, they're, uh, what you, you're thinking. Then people emerged from this cocoon in that same, that same trait that they learned when they're on social media, they're now doing in public. Yep. And there's a great video going around where – um, I don't know if I should call it great, but there's it, it was shot in a gas station or a convenience store. There was an African-American standing in line. A little white guy was taunting him and provoking him. And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Calling him names. Oh, and and the guy had that, that energy drink or something in his hand, and he just crushed that can on the guy's face, and he went down. And he probably thought, this doesn't happen in social media. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I think I've seen the video. I think the guy the guy who got hit was like, man, why'd you, what's going on, man? Why, why all the hostility? I was like, are you, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I was like, oh, well, okay. All right. Yeah. Fundamentally, people don't like to feel bad. They don't like to feel dumb. They don't like to feel like they don't matter. And something that makes you feel good and right and like you do matter is, is gives you that endorphin rush. Yeah. It makes you feel happy. And so that's what people seek out. And th- these echo chambers certainly magnify that. But that's why people seek out these charismatic figures. They seek out these people who will give them that good feeling. Right. I mean, that's the cult leaders. Yep. Exactly. That That's why it works. Not because these people are stupid or because they're – but because – Something inside them is missing that good feeling, and if there's an external source of it, they're going to be drawn to it. And Whether ultimately, the only way to combat that, I would say, is not by sort of like trying to take down each figure one at a time, because that's that's just not tenable, and you're always going to have this thing that pops up. I think you just have to increase education about yeah. this sort of thing. Like uh, the enemy of a a cult is knowledge. Basically, right. Like, they they use concealment as one of their tactics every time. Um, if you take and and uh, distraction is a good one yeah. too. If you get people more involved in healthy activities, I, I saw a statistic that that um, was about people who were in sort of the the most extreme MAGA cult, and when you gave them a hobby. Uh, they started to lose interest in it, and they started to look back and change their views and say, maybe, why did I care so much about trans women or something like that? Maybe I was a little intense about that. Like, yeah, I don't agree with it, but why did I make it such a big part of my identity? I'm into needlepoint now. And that's it's actually a good technique for engaging people's minds. And I I think uh, to kind of tack on to what you just said, 
mental health, uh, mental health awareness, oh, yeah. and, and medication. Uh, I used to have a boss who shall remain nameless, um, who admitted to me that he was on uh, some like bipolar type medication, and the problem was when he was on it. He felt good and felt like he didn't need the medication. He would get off of it, and he was a nightmare. Wow. And then his family would say, please, please, please get back on your medication. And he would get back on it, and he'd be normal for a while. So at work, it was a roller coaster right. ride. Just but these, bipolar, these yeah. people yeah. aren't getting the diagnosis and, and the medications that they need to function in a civilized society. And they're just getting, uh, you know, this... this uh, One positive here is that the stigma about mental health is starting to erode a bit, yes. which, is, which is nice. Because traditionally, right. it's always been like, if you've, got, if you've got to talk to a therapist, you're not a man. Like, you, oh, you're, you're crazy. You're, you're cra- you've got some yeah. problems. You're dangerous. I shouldn't allow you around my kids. And now it's like, oh, we all have some kind of mental health yeah. troubles. And, to and, some and, degree, yeah, uh, yes. And, and it's, it's a spectrum of it. And, yeah. and you can if you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes and have that empathy for somebody who's going through something. Yeah. And, and maybe in that sense, the, the pandemic and the, and the sort of mental trauma the whole country and the whole world endured gives us a little bit more empathy, at least on that front. Because yeah. we've all been through a little bit of depression, I think, for, yeah. from that. Oh, definitely. You know, Trevor, no doubt. Trevor and, uh, and uh, Adam t- t- touched on something very important about education being it. And one role is that was where the media was supposed to come in. The media yeah. is supposed to inform the public. And what happens, I think, kind of like what you guys are saying, they, they went to their own little corners, their own little echo chambers. Because if it bleeds, it, it's that old mentality. If it bleeds, yeah. it leads. And they said, we just need to keep the most ratings going. Like, no, you need to stop. It's not about bashing the orange monkey or supporting the orange monkey. Get the facts out. Yeah. And say, listen, we don't know everything yet, but it's okay. We'll figure out how to get the information. Just- Nothing generates clicks like anger. Right. Right. And and that's unfortunate because I I, I don't normally – I work in media, so I don't really subscribe to the fact that media is the people's enemy or whatever. But I've seen it change. And like you said, they're going after views. They're going after clicks um, because it generates revenue. And and they're going with the direction the wind is blowing. And and that really kind of breaks my heart because it's not news. I just learned something recently about the Detroit riots. Uh, Did you guys see the documentary about the history of Channel 4? Just aired recently. They're celebrating a big milestone. I, I, re- I recorded it, but I haven't watched it. Yeah, they were criticized during the Detroit riots for trying to put a, 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 a flower on it to put a, a positive spin on it and go, it's, what, it's not what you're hearing isn't happening out there. While the other it's media outlets society. were saying, it's, it's really bad out there right, right now. And after Detroit got through it, Channel 4 lost all credibility, and it took decades to build their credibility back because they were trying to tell people what they thought they wanted to hear and weren't reporting reality, and that's what we're experiencing today. Imagine a society that has that kind of expectation of the media. Yeah. <laughs> that was a while ago. You know, Damn. it's like when, when 9-11 happened. Yeah, when 9-11 happened, I can remember Peter Jennings when he was still alive. Yeah. It was this calming presence, like, we're going to inform you this is all terrifying, but there's a way to get through this. We're going to get you the information we can so no one jumps to any conclusions. We don't want to say that people like we are hearing reports that someone set up a, a bomb at the Treasury, which never happened. Yeah. But they, they, they were actually saying, we don't want to report that yet. We're going to say this is, these are all the things that have happened. This is what we need to do. I think that's where responsible media comes in. I think that's the thing you're talking about, Joe. Yeah. I saw an example of it today. Um, this this morning, uh, an explosive went off uh, in in Poland oh, at, right. the, uh, at the border of Ukraine. And on Twitter, everybody was saying, Russia is attacking Poland, World War Three. here we go. Yeah. But the news sources were, were quoting the, the people who were in charge and were saying, all right, um, it was most likely an accident. That's what, like, the swift response from everybody. So yeah. maybe there's some hope there that people yeah. are paying attention to the right people. But if, it, if you're getting your news on Twitter, you probably have a problem. Yeah, even though uh, Twitter, in a way, is kind of like uh, public access television, which we are here, is that they're not – a lot of the opinions you see on Twitter um, aren't necessarily motivated by money and resources. So you might be getting the actual story on Twitter, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, obviously there's a lot of uh, exceptions to that. So, Guys, that was – Absolutely fascinating. Uh, did not expect the conversation to go in the direction it did, but it was fantastic. Absolutely. That was great. Thank did you we, for did we rule on cults good or bad? Or? <laughs> cults bad. Okay, okay. Do I get a vote for cults good? <laughs> Thank you for being on with us, Trevor it does sound and Adam. <laughs> and do you want to give out your cult website? I always had a crush on that. Listen back. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a turn. All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks.
Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Take care. On Hollywood Crime Scene.